Shady Rest is, is a place that I grew up on. I, I moved here to Scotch Plains when I was five years old from Virginia. And uh, my aunt, she owned the grocery store right across from the first tee. And I had another aunt that owned the grocery store on the other side of the street across from the Ninth Fairway. So I was between, I would have to cross the golf course to go from one house to the other. I was born not too far from here, on Madison Avenue in Westfield. And I came here as a young lad. I used to caddy here. They fact, when I was in uh, late grade school and high school. And then before my college days, uh, I came here. And Originally, it was uh, not a black course. It was a private course. You could bring your families out here, and the kids uh, had place to uh, play and run around, and your wife uh, would not uh, sit out there on the porch with uh, friends and play cards while we were playing golf. And then after golf, they had a bar, they had a restaurant. And if you want to stay over at night, you could dance, you know. And it was just, it was a place, it just, it was no other place around here like this. This is the only one and only, the one and only Shady Rest. And I don't think there'll ever be another club like Shady Rest. The story of Shady Rest begins at the Westfield Country Club, which was established in 1900, and featured a nine-hole golf course north of the Westfield train line on Jerusalem Road in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. On either side of the club was an African-American community of small houses, and the residents would routinely cut across the golf course to get to the train line or to socialize. Over a period of years, a right of travel evolved, which later affected the legal rights of the all-white private club. And in 1921, when the Westfield Country Club considered plans to expand the course to 18 holes, this legal condition undoubtedly affected their decision. They chose instead to sell the club and merge with the Cranford Golf Club to form the Echo Lake Country Club in Springfield. The former Westfield Club was mortgaged to the Progressive Realty Company, created by a group of prominent African Americans, and became the Shady Rest Country Club, considered to be the first African American golf and country club in America. There were other black-owned and or operated golf courses before and during this period, but no other had combined golf with the clubhouse, restaurant, lockers, tennis courts, horseback riding, skeet shooting, croquet, and social activities that were available at Shady Rest and generally associated with country clubs of the era. Shady Rest was run by and for blacks and became an important social and economic institution in the local community and the New York metropolitan area. What did Shady Rest mean to uh, its community and what did white country clubs mean to uh, their community? It's a very interesting question. I think that, that white country clubs tend to be more insular, more isolated, more removed from the community basically they're just for the membership. But I don't get the sense that there was this pride invested 
uh, in the white country club by people in the local uh, community uh, that I find in a place like uh, Scotch Plains in relation to Shady Rest. Uh, this institution seemed to stand as some kind of beacon uh, for what blacks could accomplish. Furthermore, uh, the uh, arenas for black social and recreational outlet were so limited uh, that Shady Rest took on a number of functions that a white country club uh, would not. Uh, so in this sense, something that is owned by blacks, operated by blacks, for the benefit of blacks, I think uh, sort of uh, transcends the bounds of, of the normal country club and stands as a community institution much more than, than a white country club would. In addition to the golf, we had tremendous tennis. We had six tennis courts, championship tennis courts here. Right back behind me where the ninth green is was three courts, stadium courts. They had a stadium surrounding them. And just below us, there was three others. And we had the top black tennis pros and players in the country that came here to play. Of course, Althea Gibson played here and she was later. But prior to that, they had pros named Dr. Reginald Weir, uh, Erie Sage. Uh, Aura Washington, which was an old timer at that time when I was young, and she was a top tennis player. Matilda Davis, Dr. Matilda Davis and her family. Even Mr. Willis, who owned the course at the time, he was a great tennis buff, and his whole family played. His daughter Phyllis, uh, his son Billy, the other son DeWitt, and his nephew Jeff. They were all top-notch tennis players. So it was, it was great, great fun here. And I, I grew up with this, so I, I know it all. Almost every Saturday night, some kind of function was being arranged in the club, a dance or something. And most of that was community-oriented. The people from the community would participate in, uh, in those activities. Some of them were uh, free. Some of them were, you know, they charged admission to, but not all. But mostly, uh, most, most of the time it was dances, you know, open to the public, open to the community, and most of the, it was a community-oriented thing. And on certain occasions, black professional musicians used to play here a lot. A lot of the old-time musicians like Cab Calloway and Jimmy Lunsford and Earl Hines, they all played here. At Shady Rest, when we first made that appearance for that uh, warm night thing that we did, and then it became a, a weekly thing, like Saturday and Sunday. Uh, they had other bands there, and they just shoved us aside if they had a big time band coming in. They just tell us, well, you're not playing this weekend because we got Count Basie coming in, or we got Jimmy Lunsford coming in, or Lionel Hampton, or one of the other big bands. And we said, oh yeah, well, we were glad not to play because we wanted to see what they sounded like too. So we didn't mind not playing because they had a big band coming in. So uh, that's how that went. And then a lot of times we'd come out early in the daytime on nights that we weren't playing that they were going to have a, a big band there. We'd come out there early and we'd, we knew a lot of the girls out there and we'd hang out out there until it was time for the big band to show up. And then we, they let us in for nothing because we were like the house band. There was an experience where Ella Fitzgerald was here with the, the Chick Webb band when she was singing with Chick Webb when the bus uh, used to come up off of 22 Highway and come up Jerusalem Road to the club. One time the bus pulled up and my youngest sister, she lives in Atlantic City now, she was the first one up to the bus when the door opened. And when Ella stepped off the bus, she placed a silver dollar in the palm of her hand. She kept that silver dollar for years. She was one of the first children at the bus. And Ella, when she stepped off the bus, she gave her a silver dollar. In 1925, the first national colored golf championship was held at Shady Rest. This championship was organized by a group formed earlier that year in Washington, D.C., called the United States Colored Golfers Association. 
B.C. Gordon, president of Shady Rest, was elected the president of this new organization. Two years later, the group was renamed the United Golfers Association, an organization that served as the governing body of black golf until desegregation opened up many public courses to blacks in the mid-60s. In that same year, 1925, a fight for control of Shady Res erupted over mismanagement of the club's finances between forces representing a New York contingent headed by Henry C. Parker and a local group from New Jersey. The local group managed to vote out the New York slate of club officers. But the New York group was reinstated after the election was challenged in the courts. However, Sometime following this controversy, it was rumored that Parker and another New York member, John E. Nail, left Shady Rest along with money collected to pay off the mortgage, leaving the club in substantial debt. It was at this point that William Willis Sr. assumed control of Shady Rest. He owned the place. After Nails and Parker left, Right, with the monies that had gathered, I guess, for the purchase of the place or to pay the mortgage off. They left, they skipped town with it. And it was a matter of $20,000 that did that closed the deal. And the old man came up with it, with Dr. Brock out of Westfield. William Willis Sr. ran Shady Rest for the remainder of its history. In many ways, he represents the struggle of African Americans entering the mainstream of middle-class America. His son, William Jr., describes how his father accumulated money and eventually became involved with Shady Rest. He's a regimental supply sergeant. He had a business head, right? And all of the meats and whatnot, right, came through him. And then he would issue them out to, you know, uh, and the uh, officers and whatnot. So he saw that the officer, officers were well fed. And uh, to show their appreciation, he used to loan money, right? I don't know, two for one or whatever, but he made money, right? And uh, through, the, through, the, through the grapevine, you hear stories, right, that he used to like to gamble, and he's very lucky. And, and gambling, he won a lot of money. And then by loaning money, right, he also made a lot of money. Then I heard that there was a shipment going out, and the old man, the people that owed him the most money were being shipped. And the old man, through the years, by taking care of the officers, held up the shipment until payday. And then they got their money, and the old man could get his. It was Willis's vision and financial skill that allowed Shady Rest to continue and prosper. He just kept building, 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 adding, adding, adding. And then uh, people would put obstacles in his way, saying that the place was closed, that they were going out of business. So to counteract that, every week he would have a name band come in out of New York, right? He worked with Joe Glazer and uh, Cab Calloway, Blanche, all name bands. So he had to know somebody, right? But in 1938, Shady Rest was forced to change ownership and became the property of the township of Scotch Plains. These roads that you see that are paved, Plainfield Avenue and Jerusalem Road, there were nothing but dirt. And the trolley tracks stood that high up above the ground, right? So in 1930, the township, I guess, said they were going to put these two concrete roads through here. And uh, there were nothing but blacks, poor people, and nothing but big woods here at the time. Nothing but woods, right? No business, no nothing. <clears throat> so the club, all the assessment would fall on the club. So the club couldn't carry that assessment, right? We'd only been operating for about four or five years. So uh, it was suggested to the old man by Sheriff Campbell at the time, so Willis let the township take it over, lease it year by year with a gentleman's handshake agreement, nothing in writing. So this is what he did. 
And it paid off because the club couldn't exist without these roads, right? So was, he had no alternative. Throughout the shifts in control of Shady Rest, one enduring presence was that of John Shippen. Shippen came to the club in 1932 after a distinguished and historic career playing golf as well as green superintendent at some of the most exclusive golf clubs on the East Coast. He was the son of an African-American Presbyterian minister who moved to the Shinnecock Indian Reservation on Long Island in 1888. At about that time, one of the first golf courses in America, the Shinnecock Hills Golf Course, was being constructed near the reservation where the young John Shippen eventually became a caddy. He developed an interest in playing the game, later gave lessons, and served as an assistant to Scotsman Willie Dunn who functioned as the golf professional at Shinnecock. Although the PGA of America wouldn't be established until 1916, as such, John Shippen was the first American-born golfer to perform the duties of a golf professional. Shippen was good enough to compete in five U.S. Open championships through 1913. He only mentioned certain things, at, not necessarily U.S. Open, but I mentioned him saying that he, you know, he played at the Shinnecock Country Club. And he, he said he, he taught these people like uh, J.P. Morgan and so forth. And he mentioned J.P. Morgan as, a, as an example of where he didn't think much about the game, but people, uh, you know, convinced him to try it. It so happened that his first attempt at hitting the ball, he hit it and it went on the green. And he, he convinced himself that the game wasn't a challenge and he wasn't going to bother with it. But I, I understand he, he uh, gave instructions to a lot of prominent people. Shippen's participation in the 1896 Open, held at Shinnecock Hills, sparked a racial controversy when a group of white players threatened to boycott the tournament if Shippen and Oscar Bunn, a Shinnecock Indian caddy, were allowed to play. However, Theodore Havmeyer, the president of the newly formed United States Golf Association, informed the disgruntled foreigners that Shippen and Bunn would play. And they did. Shippen was tied for the lead after the first 18 holes. But during the second round, he encountered one bad hole and eventually finished fifth. There is conflicting evidence surrounding the question of John Shippen's race, whether he was an African-American or part Shinnecock Indian. The consensus is that he was an African-American of Jamaican ancestry. The fact that Shippen married a Shinnecock Indian woman and the tri-racial nature of the tribe has contributed to the dispute. He was the first black in the uh, Open, and uh, he passed off as an Indian. But we didn't talk too much about it. But I recall one Sunday, all this family came out here in their Indian regalia, right? Oh, I don't know, about eight or nine. And uh, I had a good time out here on the porch, spent the whole afternoon. Uh, again, I say I was young and I noticed it, right? Then after the years went by, learning more and more about Schiff and reading the articles, because he never spoke of it, right? Uh, I put two and two together. Although many of the members of Shady Rest were unaware of Shippen's golfing accomplishments before he came to Shady Rest, he was remembered for his influence on them as kids. Everybody liked Chip. Everybody took an interest in him, and he took an interest in the kids. He never had any kids give him any problem as far as fighting or anything like that or bad language. Or When they came over here and they started to caddy, they looked up to Chip. Very few of us, in the beginning, we called him Mr. Shippen, but he made it a point to call him Chip himself. We as kids would follow him around, caddy for him, uh, when he was working on the greens, we would go out and help him, help him carry the flags and put them in the hole. And as a caddy, you get to learn the game because 
you don't have clubs of your own, but you take the opportunity to take the clubs out of the bag that you, for the person you're caddying for, uh, and out of eye, out of eyesight, you would start swinging the club. They had a tournament over here one time, one Sunday, and um, I I really wasn't aware. I don't know what happened. Somehow it it got by me that they were having a big tournament that day, and they had a lot of a uh, they had a lot of uh, people over here to play, you know, and they needed caddies. But for some reason, I wasn't here. And I had gone to church that Sunday. And uh, it was near the end of the church service. I saw this young fellow that I knew who was a caddy, who was standing outside, you know, outside the door, outside the church, and I could see him. So I got up and went out to see what he wanted. You know, he, he looked like he was looking for somebody inside the place. And I got to ask him what he wanted. And he was looking for me. He said, come on, man. I said, what are you, I said, what are you talking about? He said, they got a big tournament over there and ship wants you to caddy. You know, so he, got, he pulled me out of church to caddy in one of the tournaments. He said, they need caddies over there. Ship looking for you. He worked this way. And he, he lived here just like a father, uncle or whatever. Buddy buddies, right? He would get up in the morning and sweep the greens, you know, to get the worm cast off and do. He'd cut the greens. Uh, he knew, knew the upkeep of a golf course. And uh, after that was done, he'd go up and pick, relax, come down his knickers on and play golf with the guests or whoever, you know. And he made a little money, you know, betting. Different people would bring white fellows up, right, from playing field in different parts, come up challenge ship. Dr. Dura from Plainfield was good for that. Uh, he had the contact with these fellas that said they were good and ship would heat them up out here. He could do anything with a golf ball. In the year 1951, we had the club championship here and I beat John Shippen. Uh, I was four down and five to go. Three down and five to go and I had four straight birdies. I birdied five, six, seven, and eight. And I beat John that day. Just one of those days when you're on. <laughs> so you, you beat the U.S. Open oh, yeah. competitor. <laughs> Sadly, in 1968, John Shippen died at the age of 90, alone in a rest home in Newark, largely ignored. When the U.S. Open was played for the second time at Shinnecock Hills in 1986, John Shippen was mentioned in the opening of the telecast by ABC. Ironically, that's when many of the former members of Shady Rest became aware of his accomplishments. In 1963, the gentleman's agreement between William Willis Sr. and the township of Scotch Plains came to an end. Shady Rest became the Scotch Hills Country Club and was open to the public. Historians view this change with mixed emotions. While the end of Shady Rest is linked to the rise of integration in public facilities in the 1960s, there is ambivalence over the inevitable deterioration of this African-American institution. What kind of uh, price uh, have black people paid for integration? We tend to think about integration in uh, positive terms. Uh, first of all, I don't believe that uh, African Americans have reached a true state uh, of integration in the society, that integration tends to be superficial. And certainly the kind of integration that we have has tended to hurt black institutions. So what happens when uh, municipal golf courses open up to blacks, when private courses uh, open up to blacks, uh, when other kinds of social institutions open their doors to blacks, oftentimes black institutions will lose uh, membership. Uh, new generations will not have the kind of rapport, relationship, uh, endearment to a black institution uh, as would uh, those who came up uh, in a segregated and exclusionary uh, era. So Shady Rest's demise has to be linked uh, to larger uh, issues beyond the municipality, beyond the community, but uh, in terms of the effects of the kinds of integration that we see taking place in American society.
Now it is with great pleasure I present to you Lee Elder, Senior PGA Touring Pro. All right, good All right, all right. As a tribute to the memory of Shady Rest and John Shippen, a local Scotch Plains community group organized a series of events at Scotch Hills. A minority youth golf clinic featuring senior professional tour golfer Lee Elder and an annual tournament named in the honor of John Shippen. The proceeds of these events resulted in the awarding of an annual minority golf scholarship and the commissioning of a painting of John Shippen by the late renowned African-American artist Don Miller. The painting is displayed prominently along with other Shippen memorabilia in the clubhouse at Scotch Hills Country Club. The story of Shady Rest represents a symbol of black achievement during a period when African Americans were suffering even more than the Depression era white Americans. The club offered the evolving black middle class a social and economic institution with access to activities not associated with the minority community. Shady Rest provided a forum for some of the most prominent African Americans of the period from all spheres of influence, Althea Gibson, Ella Fitzgerald, W.E.B. Du Bois. It was also the home of John Shippen, the first American-born golf professional. It boasted a membership of working class and professional men and women and their families and provided an atmosphere of civility and belonging in what was otherwise a hostile and unfriendly world.